Pakistan often touts the PL-15 as one of the most advanced air-to-air -air missiles in its arsenal, a weapon supposedly capable of outmatching any current Western missile system, including India's own BVR inventory. The PL-15, a Chinese-designed active radar-guided missile, is said to have a range well over 200 kilometers, with a cutting-edge AESA radar seeker, resistance to jamming, and high-speed propulsion that in theory challenges even the best in the world, including Meteor, AIM-120D, Astra MK3, and Derby ER. But the real truth of its performance during Operation Sindhua and the facts behind Pakistan's renewed push for AIM-120 AMRAMs from America tell a very different story, one that is increasingly hard for Islamabad to conceal. Let's begin by examining what Pakistan claimed. During the opening days of Operation Sindhua, Pakistani JF-17s and Chengdu J-10s armed with PL-15 missiles reportedly attempted long-range shots at Indian fighter jets crossing the engagement envelope. PR statements boasted of dynamic targeting and superior kill probability, suggesting that China's weapons had turned the tide. Social media was awash with graphics and videos purporting to show Indian jets dodging missile trails, electronic signatures of locked targets, and apparent zone denials by Pakistani air patrols. But when the dust settled and neutral observers, technical analysts, and pilots on both sides compared notes, the performance picture shifted dramatically. According to well-placed defense sources and after-action reports, not a single PL-15 missile hit its intended target during the operation. Instead, the S-400 air defense grid and India's electronic warfare played a decisive role in neutralizing the missile threat, jamming guidance links, spoofing seeker heads, and intercepting or destroying launch platforms before terminal phase. There are multiple confirmed cases where PL-15s fired at the advertised beyond visual range ended up either falling short, losing guidance mid-flight, or in several instances crashing intact, only to be recovered and studied by Indian teams. This was not simply a case of poor luck or environmental challenge, it was a comprehensive systems failure at every phase of missile engagement. Why did this happen? The answer lies in both the technical details of missile performance and the operational realities of modern air warfare. First, the PL-15 is optimized for long-range, high-altitude intercepts in permissive environments. Its design philosophy rests on launching missiles at targets well outside their own engagement range, using networked ground and airborne radars to provide mid-course updates and an AESA seeker for high-resolution terminal homing. On paper, this is formidable. It gives the JF-17 and future platforms like the J-10 see the ability to shoot first and retreat, theoretically scoring kills, without ever entering the adversary's missile envelope. However, Operation Sindhu showcased the limits of these claims. Indian fighters operated well inside the S-400 engagement umbrella, using integrated AEW and C support, advanced jamming arrays, and ingress profiles specifically tuned to avoid optimal Chinese missile geometry. Every time a Pakistani aircraft attempted to lob a PL-15 from standoff range, it failed to account for S-400 surveillance, multiband radars tracking both the jet and the missile at all altitudes and azimuths. Second, India's S-400 to missile grids sufficiently extended exo-atmospheric defense to the point where incoming PL-15s were detected and tracked at maximum range. Command protocols authorized interceptors with 200-kilometer reach, engaging both Pakistani launch platforms and their inbound missiles. Electronic jamming, frequency hopping, and data link spoofing further degraded missile guidance, making it virtually impossible for PL-15s to home on Indian jets operating inside the well-defended bubbles. AEW and C aircraft, drones, and integrated ground radars relayed real-time updates, allowing Indian fighters to maneuver dynamically and evade missile locks, with full awareness of the threat envelope at all times. Third, Pakistani fighters themselves faced severe attrition before they could exploit the full missile envelope. During the initial wave of Operation Sindhua, five Pakistani jets and an AWACS were confirmed shot down by S-400 interceptors, sometimes at distances exceeding 250 kilometers. The implication is clear. Not only did PL-15 launches fail, but Pakistan's airframes, the delivery platforms, could not survive the engagement long enough to score kills. 
Ground-based S-400 batteries, cross-linked with Indian fighters operating Meteor, imposed kill zones that Pakistani aircraft could not escape. Every launch of a PL-15 or an attempted engagement by supporting assets painted a target for Indian missile batteries, a fact not lost on any Pakistani aircrew. Over why, several PL-15 missiles launched at extreme range were found crashed fully intact in Indian territory, unexploded, unspent and ripe for technical evaluation. Defense analysts cite these incidents as proof of either guidance failure, premature cutoff, jamming success or overestimation of advertised performance by Chinese sources. The missiles, recovered and analyzed, revealed vulnerabilities in ECCM, guidance circuits, seeker memory, and warhead reliability. For Indian planners, this bounty provided invaluable data on adversary missile architecture and highlighted that the operational claims from Islamabad and Beijing were not matched by results. So why is Pakistan now lobbying so hard for AIM-120D and newer AMRAMs from America, rather than doubling down on PL-15 procurement from China, some argue it's about diversification to have a mix of missile types optimized for different platforms and tactical scenarios. But the deeper reason is credibility. The AIM-120D, as fitted to Western and NATO jets worldwide, boasts a track record of kills in combat, resistance to sophisticated jamming, and multi-target engagement capabilities across environments. Pakistan's pitch to Washington, rooted in recent air war weaknesses, focuses on the proven design, robust ECCM, and reliable seeker heads of Raytheon's offering, traits sorely missing from the PL-15's troubled record. Technical comparisons only deepen the gap. The PL-15, while longer in theoretical maximum range, suffers in electronic protection, mid-course guidance redundancy, and data link resilience. The missile is susceptible to a range of modern electronic interference, digital radio frequency memory jammers, active radar decays, and spoofing signals confound its seeker. In contrast, the AIM-120D's two-way data link, improved kinematics, and hardened ECCM make it far more flexible against fifth-generation adversaries, and less likely to go blind when radar conditions or electronic warfare become complex. Indian AEW and C and ground radar systems, paired with Meteor, further expose the differences. The implications for air warfare are tectonic. During Operation Sindhua, for every PL-15 launched, not a single Indian jet was shot down. Meanwhile, Pakistani airframes were attrited at a scale not seen in previous conflicts. The S-400's multiband radars, massed batteries, and kill boxes outmatched not only Pakistan's fighters, but its best missile technology. Indian AEW and C, ground radars, and networked fighter swarms made every approach dangerous, every launch risky. Pakistan's own official post-battle assessments quietly acknowledged shortcomings. Debriefs highlighted issues in missile programming, seeker instability under electronic attack, and breakdowns in network targeting. Independent observers noted that none of the lost Indian fighters or support aircraft exhibited damage consistent with PL-15 strikes. Conversely, Pakistani wrecks bore clear S-400 warhead signatures. The aircraft losses and failed missile launches pushed Islamabad to re-examine not just missile options, but the entire concept of air operations against a heavily shielded adversary. Critics in Pakistan's defense establishment began asking hard questions. Why trust Chinese missile data sheets when the battlefield facts diverge? Should the Air Force bank its future on a weapon that, under duress, delivered zero kills? Why gamble on untested upgrades when an adversary's electronic warfare and missile defense so clearly outpace your offense? At the diplomatic level, the shift towards American AMRAMs indicates a recognition of this vulnerability. Pakistan's appeal for AIM-120D3 is not just about electrons and explosives, it's about interoperable command, reliability under duress, and alliance credibility. The hope is that a Western missile, proven in real-world conflicts and regularly upgraded with new ECCM packages, will overcome the embarrassing legacy of failed PL-15 launches in Sindhua. From an Indian perspective, post-Sindhua lessons have shaped procurement and air defense strategy. The S-400 grid, now expanding up to 10 batteries, covers every ingress vector. Project Kusha brings redundancy, homegrown technology and shorter supply chains. Akash fills lower altitude gaps, offering multi-target engagement and rapid salvo capability. 
Indian fighters train under these domes for standoff tactics, electronic attack, and ambush hook launches. Meteor, Astra, Derby ER, and Russian RVVBD expand the range of Indian BVR and standoff options, making any future PL-15 salvo Chinese or otherwise unlikely to penetrate. Operational doctrine in India now treat S missile defense as a system of systems challenge, AEW and C, satellites, electronic warfare, ground radar, and battery commanders link in real time, prioritizing incoming threats, assigning interceptors, and shifting air patrols to optimal scramble geometry. The missile forest extends from 12 to 400 kilometers with direct handoff from long to medium to short range interceptors. S-400s engage at max distance, Kusher at intermediate, Akash at point defense, and Meteor slash Astra swarms fill fighter-generated kill boxes. On the Pakistani side, the shift to aim 120D3 signals not just a technical, but a strategic recalibration. The Air Force aims for greater reliability, ECCM resilience, and multi-platform integration. The hope is that American guidance and updates will plug the gap left by poorly performing PL-15s and provide a next-generation backbone for both JF-17s and F-16s. But without an overhaul in tactical doctrine, improved U, and survivable launch platforms, even AMRAMs cannot guarantee kills in a dense, multi-layered Indian defense web. Multiple recovered PL-15s now sit in Indian evaluation labs. Analysts pour over seeker chips, data link boards, and warhead assemblies to gauge future vulnerabilities. Defense policy circles note that despite millions spent on procurement, Pakistan did not down a single fighter during Sindhua, while India's S-400s and AEW and C-directed fighters leveled five jets and a high-value AWACS in a single night. Washington's decision to supply Pakistan with the AIM-120 D-3 AMRAMs, America's premier active radar-guided air-to-air missile, could be a strategic misstep, with consequences rippling far beyond South Asia. The AIM-120 series represents the cutting edge of Western missile technology, with advanced ECCM, long-range engagement, and two-way data link, it's designed for flexibility and dominance in modern aerial combat. Yet by making this missile available to Islamabad, Washington is inadvertently handing Beijing, not just an ally of Pakistan, but its principal defense supplier, a unique opportunity to study the weapon up close, probe for vulnerabilities, and potentially reverse engineer significant elements of its design. The risk lies not only in Pakistan's operational use, but in the very nature of regional defense ties. China has deep defense collaborations with Pakistan, spanning joint exercise, maintenance, and platform upgrades from the JF-17 to AWACS and missile systems like the PL-15. It's standard in Pakistani procurement contracts for Chinese engineers and technicians to have technical access to the platforms and systems Pakistan acquires. Once the AIM-120D enters PAF service, it's inevitable that China will seek physical access, whether for joint maintenance, integration studies, or even outright technical evaluation under the guise of deepening the defense partnership. Why does this matter for you, S. China competition? The AIM-120D includes proprietary countermeasures, classified seeker technology, and secure software vulnerable in ways that careful study could reveal. The opportunity for China is immense. By examining the missile's physical, electronic, and software package, they could identify ECCM protocols, stealth engagement logic, guidance algorithms, or data link methods. Even a single unit, captured intact after a malfunction, training mishap, or through permitted technical access, would offer Beijing a laboratory to probe U.S. missile resilience and perhaps find weaknesses to exploit in a future air battle over the Pacific. In a U.S.-China war scenario, the stakes shift dramatically. American air power relies heavily on the assumed superiority and classified nature of AIM-120 derivatives. If Chinese labs can develop tailored jammers, seeker spoofing software, or aerodynamic countermeasures by studying Pakistani missiles, the technological gap could narrow. China's own missile programs, especially the PL-15, could leap ahead, incorporating hard-learned lessons from real Western tech rather than simulated or theoretical adversaries. History offers caution. Soviet access to captured U.S. missiles during the Cold War led eventually to the rapid evolution of Soviet missile and countermeasure technology. The risk is even higher in the digital age, 
where microchips, firmware, and encrypted data links are at the heart of missile performance. China's prowess in electronics, signals, and software means reverse engineering would be swift and efficient. The result might be a next-gen PL series missile tailored to defeat the very systems U.S. jets depend upon or vulnerabilities published across China's own fighter fleet. By arming Pakistan with AIM-120D3, the U.S. opens the door to technology leakage. In the chessboard of great power competition, handing the opponent a window into your top missile tech is a risk that could echo across every future engagement. This move deserves scrutiny not only in Islamabad, but in Washington and Beijing, where the real air war of the future will be decided by who knows more about the other side's missile secrets. In summary, the gap between rhetoric and battlefield reality has never been wider. Pakistan's reliance on PL-15s proved disastrous at every phase, guidance failures, jamming, survivability, and lack of kills. India's air defense network, AEW and C, missile redundancy, and fighter support outmatched everything China could supply. The turn toward AIM-120D3 from America is an implicit admission. When it counted, Chinese technology failed and Western systems were deemed necessary to rebuild credibility. A future Indo-Pak air battles, doctrine, integration and survivability will trump sheer missile numbers and range. India's expanding S-400 umbrella, integrated Kusha and Akash shields, and robust fighter BVR network present an adversary with attrition rates and denial zones not matched anywhere in the region. Every new engagement will be decided within the AI-driven networks, missile domes, and standoff tactics that define modern air power. Pakistan's PL-15 narrative is now a cautionary tale. In Operation Sindhua, reality proved ruthless. Not a single kill, not an effective missile, not a single breach in Indian defense. The future will not be shaped by claims, but by results. Results that speak for themselves across a landscape dominated by Indian air superiority, missile integration, and relentless technological adaptation. This is the truth behind the air war. Claims fall, data remains, and only the best survive. As India forges ahead, adding new S-400 batteries, refining Project Kusha, upgrading Akash, and fielding Meteor and Astra Mark III, Pakistan's Air Force faces a future where reliability, resilience, and real-world results matter far more than promotional data sheets or diplomatic boasts. The verdict of Operation Sindhua is clear, and lessons learned are shaping new strategies on both sides. For India, confidence in its grids and offensive air integration grows with each test, each engagement, each recovered missile. For Pakistan, the challenge is to catch up, not just by adding new missiles, but by fundamentally changing how it fights, how it thinks, and how it prepares for the next inevitable test by fire and steel. In South Asia's sky, truth will be proven not by press releases, but by debris fields, missile recoveries, and the hard data of victory and defeat. And in that contest, the edge is now India's.